Game engines are complicated. They all come with hundreds of features, endless tabs and buttons, and a really steep learning curve. So I asked myself, what if a game engine was so simple that anyone could make a game with real code in just 5 minutes? Well, after 9 months of building, coding, and questioning my life choices, I actually made one. And today, I'm gonna show you the simplest game engine ever, and exactly how I built it. But first things first, how do you even build a game engine? Behind the scenes, it's way more complicated than it looks. You need to figure out the game engine's design, graphics, game loops, input handling, and a hundred other things. And because I wanted mine to run right in the browser, I also had to build an entire website around it. So I knew if I was going to pull this off, I had to decide what to keep, and more importantly, what to cut, to make the engine truly simple. And for inspiration, I didn't look at Unity or Unreal. I looked at Scratch. Scratch is really easy to use. It's block-based. You drag and drop blocks, click the green flag, and boom, your game works. There's no setup, no confusing tabs, no scary error messages, just instant results. And I should know, because I spent a lot of time on Scratch. I may or may not have made dozens of front page games and multiple video tutorial series. So since my goal is to build the simplest game engine ever, taking inspiration from Scratch just made sense. But for my game engine, I wanted real code, not blocks. So instead of blocks just staying as blocks when you drop them, I made them transform into actual TypeScript code. Which, if you don't know what that is, it's basically JavaScript with some extra features. To make this work, I built a custom library that maps every block directly to TypeScript. Sort of like a dictionary, with words and definitions, where the block is the word and the code is the definition. Drag a block, and boom, you get real code that runs your game. That way, you still get the fun and simplicity of dragging blocks around, but you're also being a pro coder and writing real code at the same time. Once I built out that idea, I started sketching out the bigger picture. A Scratch-like game engine where you use TypeScript to build games directly in your browser. But where do you even begin to make a game engine, let alone one that runs on the web? I knew I wanted it to have a block area, a code editor, a game window, sprites, and a drawing area. That was just the front end, the part people would see and interact with. Behind the scenes though, I also needed the back end, the complicated logic that actually makes everything work. And since users will be coding their games in TypeScript, I decided to build everything also in TypeScript. Because why not? So I locked myself in a room, started coding, and fast forward 9 months, I had this giant, complex project with a million files. Yeah, I know, this is not exactly the most pleasant thing to look at, but I swear all these files are needed to make my game engine and website. I split my project into 4 main components. The game engine, the execution system, the storage system, and website stuff. The game engine was the part you actually interact with. The blocks area, code editor, game window, sprites, and drawing area. This was mostly built with TypeScript, plus some HTML and CSS for the buttons, tabs, and UI. Next, the execution system, which is the real brain of the engine. This was a lot more complicated to create. I had to figure out how to get the execution system to render the game objects, get the game loop up and running, and make whatever code you wrote in the editor to actually affect what happens on screen. With these two components, I had a working game engine, but I also needed to be able to save everything. So I had a storage system, which, as you guessed, saved everything. For this, I used Supabase, which gave me a database to store everything, plus authentication so that people could sign up and log in into the website. And this leads to the final part, the website stuff. I won't go into detail about this part because, honestly, it was kind of boring. It was just packaging everything up and sending it off so the game engine could actually live on the web. Now, with all these components working together, I finally had an engine on a website that anyone could use. The game engine was simple enough to navigate, but there was still one big challenge. Coding. Coding has always been the hardest part of making games, especially for beginners. In most game engines, changing something basic such as an object's position, brightness, or rotation means writing very different bits of code for each one. This is confusing, hard to remember, and really easy to mess up. So I made it simple. I created a predefined keyword called sprite that had all of these properties built in. Want to move the sprite? No problem. Just set sprite.x to a new value. Want to adjust its brightness? Just change its brightness. Want to update its rotation? Same thing. With this, everything is in one place, and it all works the same way. 
I mean, just compare what I have here to what you type in Unity. And to make things even easier, I added little number bubbles inside the blocks so you can just change the number and drag the block into the code editor. The next big improvement was the delay system. Let's say you're coding in Unity, and you want your game object to wait one second before doing something. What do you think the code looks like? Well, it looks like this. Or this. Yeah, that's a lot of lines and confusing code for something as simple as waiting one second. Since CodeWisp uses TypeScript, I was able to build a simple wait command. So instead of all of this complicated code to create a delay, you could just write wait one. And that's it. The code does exactly what it says. Next up, I tackled game loops. In most game engines, each game object only gets one main loop per code file. And that loop has to handle everything. That's fine if your object is doing things that are simple or straightforward. But the moment you add complexity, it can quickly turn into a dumpster fire. The usual workaround for this is to attach multiple code files to the same object so you can split things up. But now you have a bunch of files to manage, and that can be its own headache. So my solution? One code file per object. But inside that file, you can have as many game loops as you want, all running independently. One loop for movement, another for changing size, another for whatever you want it to do. And this works especially well with my delay system. For example, let's say you want an object to move continuously and grow every second. If both of these actions are in the same loop, the wait part would also pause the movement. But by splitting them into separate loops, both actions run smoothly at the same time. Lastly, to make things even simpler, I removed all of the extra default code you usually see in game engine files. In CodeWisp, the code you write is the code that runs. Nothing extra. And with that, I finally had the simplest game engine ever. That means no more random auto-generated code with words you don't understand, and no more memorizing complex stuff just to do something simple. But of course, I didn't want to be the only one making games. So after I initially released CodeWisp, I added project sharing. And over 4,000 of you signed up. And I have to say, you guys made some pretty awesome stuff. Like this Geometry Dash clone, this clicker game, and even this 3D platformer? Oh yeah, and to top it off, I also added multiplayer into the game engine. I've also been reading all of your feedback in my Discord, and in the forums, which is part of my website. And I've been updating the site based off of what you told me. So thank you for that. And to show you just how simple this engine is, let me walk through a few games that I built myself. Okay, so this Flappy Bird game was made in just 32 lines of code. As you can see here, we have a fully working Flappy Bird game, and we only have 13 lines of code in the Bird Sprite, and 19 lines of code inside of the Pipe Sprite. And the code is pretty straightforward. You don't need years of programming knowledge to be able to understand this. So let me go over a quick explanation. So inside of the Bird Sprite, we're just setting the sprite's X and Y positions. So this is gonna be near the left, and this is gonna be near the top of the screen. We're also setting the sprite's size and rotation, and after that we have a variable called Y velocity. And this is our main game loop for the bird. So inside of here, we are going to be making the bird fall, and after that we're checking if the user is pressing the space bar, and if it is, we are going to be making the bird fly up. And this is just updating the bird's rotation to make it look a bit better. And all of that gives us a flapping bird. Next, for the pipe sprite, we are setting the pipe's X and size, and we have some pipe clone stuff going on. So inside of here, the pipe clones are always moving towards the left side of the screen, and if it's touching the bird, then the game is going to stop. And after that, we are constantly creating a top and bottom pipe. So we have this bottom pipe, and we set its Y position and rotation, and same thing for the top pipe we set its Y position and rotation, and then we wait two seconds every single time. So that gives us our completed Flappy Bird game, just like that. Super straightforward and pretty easy to understand, only 32 lines of code. So our next game is this zombie shooter game, and this is only 74 lines of code for this entire game. We have a player, and we can shoot at zombies which are following us, and if we touch a zombie, then the game is going to stop, just like that. So for our player sprite, we have our main game loop. This is going to move our player. So our player is always going to point towards the mouse pointer, 
and it's also going to move if we press the arrow keys or if we press WASD. And after that, we have another loop, and this is going to be for the shooting. So if we hold the mouse button down, then it's going to create a clone of the bullet. After that, we are just checking if the player is touching the zombie, then the game is going to stop. Next, for the bullet sprite, we have some bullet clone stuff. So when a bullet clone is created, we are going to set all of this stuff, just making sure it starts at the player and making sure that it points in the right direction. And after, the bullet is going to move and check if it's touching a zombie. And if it is, the bullet is going to get deleted. Lastly, we have our zombie sprite. So this is some more clone stuff. We are going to be spawning the zombies randomly in the Y position. We are also setting some health and speed variables for the zombie. And inside of this loop, we are making the zombies always point towards the player and move um, in that direction. And after that, we are checking if the zombies are touching the bullet, it's going to lose health. And if it has no more health, the zombie is going to get deleted. Um, and we do some brightness animation uh, flashing for that. And we create one zombie clone every second. So that's it. We have three sprites, 74 lines of code, and a fully working shooter game. You can make this entire game in just like 5 to 10 minutes, and you know how exactly everything works. Anyways, if you want to try it out, head over to CodeWisp.net. You can share your games, play other people's games, and join the forums to chat and give feedback. But anyways, that's it for this video. See ya!